We are going to open with uh, Vint Cerf, which is always a pleasure. If you ever have a moment where you have 15 minutes, there is a great uh, YouTube video where Vint Cerf was, video, was uh, uh, interviewed for this conference two years ago with Steve Crocker, and it's just one of my favorites. I have to admit, I've watched it several times because he just goes through all these you know, moments where he's like, well, we, weren't, we were thinking about this and we tried that and it worked and it seems like it's still working and it's great. And we all get the pleasure of all of his you know, smart ideas on an everyday basis. And I just can't thank him enough for what he you know, kind of got this whole internet party started for us and all the things that we get to do because there were gentlemen like him who were smart enough to realize that there were you know, things that we could be doing with the, the, the web technology beyond just using it for its limited purposes back in the, the 60s and early 70s. Um, so, Vint, if you will mind, come up and just kind of get, get us started here. Come on, come on up. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to participate in, uh, in IGF USA, and I wanted to make a couple of observations about the regional and national IGF meetings. I think they are uh, incredibly important, uh, especially given that this phenomenon is sort of grassroots of bottom up. Uh, these things did not happen in consequence of the uh, UN sponsored uh, IGF. They happened because people thought they needed to have conversations uh, locally about issues arising. So I want to encourage uh, you to participate uh, in these things in the future, because even if the international uh, IGF were to evaporate for some reason, I think the aggregate of the uh, national and regional IGFs uh, could combine uh, together to support further and continued international uh, multi-stakeholder meetings. Uh, I have the... Uh, convenience of being able to stand up here and state the obvious um, because I'm the first speaker and, and that way uh, I will say all the things that you already know and all the other speakers are likely to say but I can get away with it because I'm the first speaker. So uh, let me tell you how uh, this current situation with the internet looks to somebody who's been around and engaged uh, from its very beginning. We thought it was important to have an open and free internet, freely accessible uh, internet. And as you know, Bob Kahn and I gave away the, uh, the design uh, deliberately, published all the uh, specifics, uh, encouraged the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architecture Board as they were formed to continue evolution in a very public, open, and multi-stakeholder way. Uh, the protocols were very open. Uh, technically speaking, people could add new protocols if they wanted to, by both horizontally and vertically. And of course, that, that is exactly what has happened. When the World Wide Web came along, Tim Berners-Lee layered HTTP on top of TCP IP. All of this openness um, led to what many of us call uh, permissionless innovation. Uh, all of which was very satisfying to me, uh, watching this grow in a very organic way. Uh, there is only one small little detail that uh, had not uh, penetrated my thinking in the early stages, and that's what happens when the general public gets access. And this was something I promoted strongly, especially in the late 1980s. Uh, the problem is that the general public is the general public, and it covers everybody, including the bad actors, who in fact do not have your best interests at heart. And so now, having created this giant engine, which gave everyone the freedom to speak. Now all the bad guys also had the freedom to speak and they spoke in some fairly um, harmful ways. Uh, on the technical side, these bad actors could speak malware. Uh, and you know, you know what DDoS attacks are. Uh, there are amplified DDoS attacks. These are the ones that make use of the domain name system. You use uh, fake uh, uh, source addresses to make a query to the DNS and the response goes to whatever the fake address was, and the fake address is the target of the amplified DDoS attack. So the DNS, which is part of the infrastructure of the internet, is used to amplify an attack against a particular target. Now there are technical responses to many of these things, although frankly, not all the ISPs have implemented those technical responses. For the geeks in the crowd, BCP38 is supposed to be designed to inhibit 
the injection of packets that have false source addresses in them, but it hasn't been widely implemented. And if there are any ISPs in the room who haven't implemented it, shame on you. Uh, but I ha can't help but observe that Twitter is another example of an amplified DDoS attack, because when you tweet something, uh, if it gets retweeted by a collection of people, that's an amplification. And so in some sense, we are recurring uh, in, our, in the social networking space in the way that, uh, and, and discovering the same kinds of uh, harmful problems that showed up in the technical space. Now, I'm not going to go any further on the technical responses to many of these problems, except to say that uh, one of the hardest problems is that uh, programmers don't know how to write software that doesn't have bugs. And that's why malware works. And so those of us who care greatly about the uh, research into programming really wish that we had better tools to keep ourselves from making mistakes that can be exploited later on. But I have to tell you that, that we are in our infancy when it comes to that. We've had 80 plus years of programming in one way or another and have failed miserably to find ways to inhibit some of the stupid bugs that we still put into our programs. But I want to, uh, to move over now to what I think is the more uh, uh, critical question for this uh, convening. By the way, the, the uh, uh, summary of the meetings and everything is fabulous. I mean, you have just an absolutely amazing array of people here, and I'm kicking myself because I have to leave at 10.30 to get to the West Coast to work on the interplanetary internet at the Jet Propulsion Lab. <laughs> Uh, and I know we're all very concerned about Martian porn because we don't quite know how to recognize it, you know, and so we don't know how to filter it out. Uh, so I want to switch over to the social networking side of things because that is in some sense um, part of the problem that we're grappling with today, many of the themes uh, that you'll be dealing with. Um, I think that uh, we can see that social networks produce a kind of amplification uh, there is a couple, bubble reinforcement effect. Uh, sometimes uh, this is called uh, a re a bias, a reinforcement uh, bias, where you take a piece of information that matches your view of things, and by seeing it repeated in a social networking environment, it reinforces your belief that that's, uh, that's the correct thing and anything else is not. So we have this bubble effect, which is starting to show up, uh, in the internet. And it, it's funny in a way because on the surface it looked like it would be a helpful thing to steer you in the direction of things you care about and are interested in. But the trouble is that it creates this uh, 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 amplification and reinforcement effect which isolates people from uh, information that would have perhaps persuaded them to consider alternative views. So we have that problem to, to worry about. And there have been some attempts uh, in the social networking space, Facebook and others, to try to, even at Google, to try to expose people to things that they didn't necessarily uh, appear to want to uh, get access to. The Arab Spring was a very good concrete example of the way in which people have decided to use uh, social networking techniques, you know, Facebook in particular. Um, and so what this told us, I think, is that uh, people will figure out how to use our technologies in ways that we might not have anticipated. You can see the reaction of uh, authoritarian regimes to this kind of use of online uh, facilities. Uh, it's scary to think that a population that you are trying to control has the ability to bypass government limitations and to coordinate uh, and, to, uh, and to organize. Uh, if you were uh, in the Chinese government, for example, and you were watching uh, the Arab Spring happen, I think this would scare you. Uh, and those of you who know Chinese history better than I do uh, may recall that almost all of the major regime changes in China as you move from one dynasty to another were preceded by peasant rebellions of one kind or another. And so if you were currently in the, in the Chinese uh, government, uh, high government, uh, you'd be looking at 1.2 or 1.3 billion people worried about this particular uh, risk. What I find absolutely amazing is that um, the Chinese government has simultaneously done two things. They have invested mightily in the internet infrastructure. 700 million plus Chinese are online in China. So there's been huge investment in implementation. 
fiber networks, online uh, assets of various kinds, and at the same time that they have introduced a substantial degree of control. Uh, and this is scary in some respects and painful uh, to watch because, of course, many of us hoped that the Internet would inhibit exactly that kind of control. But, in fact, the Chinese have demonstrated it's possible to filter uh, a great deal of content, uh, to use legal methods, uh, and I suppose some people would say illegal methods, in order to limit what people are able to say. Uh, the, you've noticed that there are some very big companies that have evolved in the Chinese internet environment, Alibaba, for example, and Baidu, and so on, uh, WeChat. These companies are substantial in scale. They rival, uh, in terms of numbers of users, many of the other uh, large companies that you see here in the United States and elsewhere. But they are uh, largely uh, under uh, Chinese uh, control with regard to censorship. So what we're seeing uh, is a kind of reaction to the openness and freedom in the internet. It translates into fragmentation. Uh, it translates into some other things which are even more disturbing for me personally anyway. Uh, and these are attempts by uh, national governments to extend in an extraterritorial way their control over content. And so there are debates right now going on leading up to the European uh, uh, Court of Justice, which, which in my view may be uh, a kind of misnomer, uh, that uh, this question of the right to be forgotten should not simply be limited to uh, the European countries, but it should be global in scope. We're seeing similar kinds of behavior in other countries, even in Canada, for example, where the debate is, should information that should be if it, if it should be adjudicated that this information should be suppressed in Canada, should it be suppressed everywhere in the world? These are not good outcomes for those of us who believe that openness and freedom of expression is vital uh, to uh, a democratic society. Well, that leads to yet another phenomenon, which all of you are very familiar with, especially given the most recent uh, presidential campaign in the United States, and that's misinformation and the so-called fake news. Uh, again, this manifestation uh, is another example of the kind of selection bias and, uh, and silo reinforcement uh, that I mentioned earlier. There was a Russian disinformation campaign, uh, and they are, as many of you know, quite skilled at this kind of uh, propaganda. Uh, it's not the first time that they've made use of it, although this might be the first time they've used it heavily in an online environment. And apparently, uh, people were making money out of this campaign. In Macedonia, if I remember correctly, people were paid to generate completely ridiculous articles about the uh, Hillary Clinton or uh, others uh, who were part of the presidential uh, competition. Uh, so it's sort of ironic that one of the poorest countries in Europe turned out to be making um, income out of generating fake news. And the worst part about all this is that this fake news was accepted in many circles here in the United States. And the question is, why is that? How can this happen? What's going on here? Well, part of it is an uncritical audience and, or a polarized audience where the fake news somehow reinforced their beliefs, uh, even though they may, may have made absolutely no logical sense whatsoever. It's this uncriticality that really disturbs me a lot. Uh, I think that, that we should be teaching uh, children how to think critically about the information that they get. They should ask, where did it come from? They should ask, who else believes this information? What other sources are there? Uh, how, you know, can, we, can we find a way to confirm the uh, accuracy of the information that we're receiving in this system? And the fact that there are a lot of people who don't care to waste time thinking about the information they get is very disturbing to me. It's not just the internet that creates this problem. It's all the other media as well. You get uh, information, misinformation from television, radio, movies, magazines, newspapers, the internet, your friends, your parents. There are all kinds of ways in which to get information which is incorrect. 
and not thinking about it is very disturbing. However, you get the other side of this coin. There are some uh, families who have the belief that, you know, that there is this authority uh, is, rests in the family and that any information which the family doesn't agree with should be rejected, even if it turns out that what the family believes is in fact wrong. And so you get uh, another strong biasing effect in some parts of our society here in the US where certain families will reject any notion of critical thinking because they consider it that it undermines the authority of the family. So I find that kind of scary. Uh, there's another big problem uh, which contributes to this, uh, this situation, and that's the failing business models for journalism. Yeah, in, the, in the past, paper, newspaper in particular, turned out to be one of the cheapest ways of reproducing large quantities of information on a regular basis. And since everyone wanted to know what the news was, the people who developed the notion of newspaper also put in advertisements because they figured, well, they're going to read the news and they'll see the ads and I can charge people for that. It was perfect. It had a few features associated with news cycle. You had to get your stories done by a certain time in order to print the news and get the newspapers delivered. And so they're evolved out of this. Oh, I left out classified ads, which is another wonderful way of generating money. Now, we all know that many of those um, revenue generators have evaporated and reincarnated themselves in the online environment. So that undermined some of the uh, business models that led to uh, substantial quality journalism because the newspapers could afford to do investigative reporting, to pay people for that, to pay people to be uh, on site all around the world providing uh, content. So as those business models started to evaporate, uh, that created a real problem for quality journalism. It's fair to say, by the way, that those of you who say, well, you know, Google and the internet have destroyed the news business, I would like to resist that conclusion a little bit and argue that, uh, at least in our society, we were drifting away from newspaper uh, as a source of information. As radio and especially as television came along, people were turning to those media rather than newspapers uh, in order to get information. And there was a certain impatience in our society uh, that I think uh, limited our willingness to spend time absorbing and analyzing and evaluating new information. Uh, if you don't mind a small anecdote, <clears throat> some years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, I was in New York having lunch with Henry Kissinger. And uh, we sat down and Dr. Kissinger said to me, I hate the internet. And I thought, well, the lunch is over and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm leaving now. Uh, and, but I said, well, why is that Dr. Kissinger? Kissinger? And he said, well, uh, people are satisfied with two paragraph answers and I write 700 page books. And so I could see his logic. Uh, he also said something else which is not relevant to this conversation except tangentially. He said he was also very unhappy with the fact that his grandchildren could not read cursive writing. They weren't being taught cursive, which meant that the huge collection of historically important letters that he had were not accessible to his grandchildren. And I actually, stop to think, my God, that's right, that kids don't see cursive very much anymore at all. They see printed material. So that, as I say, that's a tangential observation. But I think that, uh, that Kissinger was right about this satisfaction with too little information. And I think this uh, dogs us still today. Well, you know, so we have this, this problem of trying to reinvent journalism, reinvent business models. In the meantime, you know, we have this you know, headline writing that is intended to capture eyeballs and not necessarily intended to convey reality. And so we get you know, headline grabbing uh, ads and things like that and loss of revenues. There is a silver lining, however, uh, at least in my view, uh, when Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post for an insanely small amount of money relative to his available resources. Uh, my impression as a Washington resident for 50, 41 years now is that the quality of the Washington Post journalism has increased again. And uh, even if you don't agree with me, uh, I think they are certainly in, in a position to put more effort into 
uh, gathering news, analyzing it, and uh, doing more investigative uh, reporting. And I think that's partly a result of, of Jeff's uh, willingness uh, to underwrite that cost. But somewhere along the line, uh, we are going to have to figure out how to reincarnate business models that will support good quality journalism because of its uh, essential importance in uh, open and, and uh, uh, free democratic societies. So I, I want to, uh, to try to summarize uh, a little bit here ways in which we might respond to some of these problems. Uh, the first one, uh, I'll reiterate again, is early training in critical thinking. And I, I really am sad to think that there are people who would resist uh, such an initiative. I don't understand how uh, we could possibly have a society which is able to evolve in, in the face of all these new technologies without being able to think critically about what we're seeing and hearing. We clearly have to reinvent uh, the business of news. And I don't have really good answers for you. I wish I did, I'm short of suggesting that others like Jeff should keep buying uh, newspapers. Maybe we should you know, suggest that the other billionaires from the internet world consider acquiring all the newspapers that are uh, failing. On the other hand, if that becomes too concentrated, then we have a different problem on our hands, which we've also experienced in the past. There's also been suggestions that somehow we should be able to automate the process of filtering what we're calling fake news and misinformation. And I've given some thought to this, and it turns out it's not as easy as it sounds. For example, uh, if you try to use a kind of voting mechanism that says this news is valid and this news is not, people who create botnets can use the power of the botnet to vote, to upvote fake information if they want to. And so the, the algorithms that uh, often are used to try to decide whether something is important or something is significant uh, get distorted by uh, mechanisms that automate uh, these uh, upvoting processes. And we saw a lot of that. I mean, the battle of the bots uh, could very well describe the previous uh, presidential campaign, and it continues to dog us today. So figuring out how to detect that sort of thing. I mean, I'm sure many of you have logged onto a website and seen a little thing that says, I am not a robot. And you're supposed to click the, uh, you know, of course, it's pretty easy to write a piece of software that sees I am not a robot in the web page and clicks the, the, that little box. So uh, we have the, the problem of the software getting smarter and smarter. And in some sense, we're defeating ourselves. Uh, I think that, that what would be really important we lost the screen, so I'm just checking. Oh, it seems like the computer went to sleep. Yeah, just the computer went to sleep. No capture. Well, I don't care if the computer went to sleep. I'm more concerned whether everybody in the audience went to sleep. And and you're not even allowed to bring the coffee into the room either, which is really ter <laughs> terrible. Um, so here we are. Uh, you've got this fabulous day ahead of you uh, to arm wrestle with some of the problems that I've tried to outline and others that are uh, shown in the, in the program. I think what will be really helpful and important is at the end of the day, if you can collect some thoughtful and practical ideas for combating the problems that we're seeing, would be super helpful because I would love to see you bring those to the Geneva meeting in December. If we think a little bit about the value of these regional and national IGFs, it's assembling thoughtful outcomes and bringing them to the uh, international uh, meeting and to draw attention to some of those solutions and, of course, to compare with each other, uh, with the other IGFs, uh, regional IGFs, um, the conclusions that we reach. But in some sense, the fact that you're here in this room says you care about this agenda. And I hope that some significant fraction of you will be able to bring anything that came out of this discussion that you consider to be practical and implementable uh, to that table. One last point, as you, uh, as you look at the internet as we see it today, uh, you could reasonably ask, is this helping our societies or is it harming it? And I think you would find answers on both ends of that uh, scale. 
But what I would like to ask you to do is to think more about how we can make the internet more useful for people. Let's make it a more people-centered system, something which is taking into account solving problems for people, helping people discover uh, each other in ways in which they can uh, help each other uh, to, uh, to make life a lot better for us and others in this world. It would be really disappointing if it turned out that all of this, for me, 40-year effort uh, into the internet turned out to uh, produce something which it turned out to be more harmful than beneficial. And I'm sort of relying on you in this room to make sure that doesn't happen. So I think I'll stop there and thank you all very much for your morning's attention. Thank you very much.